got a bit of a background in species distribution modeling and today I want to talk about um, some of the extra steps that you can take with your occurrence data in ecological modeling. This is usually the first step uh, you have to take when you're putting together a model and it can be one that people overlook and yet it can have profound um, influence over your results. So uh, there's some filtering that you can do in the point and click dashboards um, that are available in EcoCommons, but here we just want to talk about some of the extra steps that you can you can do with your your occurrence data, and you can do these things in R in the coding cloud on EcoCommons. So. Just to just to remind you that uh, EcoCommons is this place with this huge vision where Australian practitioners and researchers can use trusted world leading ecological and environmental modeling tools to protect and restore the planet. So we've got a, a, a big vision and we want to just make your life as a researcher easier. And that's what we try and do with the point and click dashboards, but it's also what we're trying to do with uh, some of the functionality that you can do in addition to those point and click dashboards in a coding environment. And what we're presenting here today is by no means um, the only way to to deal with the current data. There's a lot more things you could you could do. And as EcoCommons grows, we expect to have more scientific workflows available. And uh, please get Get in touch if if you think anything could be done better or if, if if corrections are needed. But none of what we do would be possible without our many partners. And I just want to review those who might not have watched the first video, which was the introduction, that there's this amazing paper on the process of ecological modeling. And today we're talking just about the occurrence data part of the process which can take a lot of time to, to work through, but it's a critical part of the process. Uh, in a previous video, in the introduction video, we talked a lot about conceptualization and some of the things you need to think about before you get started, but I'd highly recommend you check out this paper if you get a chance. And as I mentioned in that previous video, um, while you're evaluating your modeling, you need to understand if your available data is going to answer the question that you have in mind. And if you have outstanding data, you're going to be able to answer most questions with it. So if you have highly systematically collected data, um, where every time you didn't run into your target species, uh, you recorded a zero and your sampling was representative of both geographic and environmental space and you did the same thing every time a survey was done boy you're you're in rare rare air but biodiversity data is not available across the globe um, that has been systematically collected it just doesn't exist in fact there's a lot of taxa that we don't even have named yet, let alone have systematic occurrence data available for them. So a lot of the modeling we do deals with unstructured or even opportunistic data that's available. And we're going to talk about some of the things that you can do in the first step um, of your modeling process, which is dealing with your occurrence data to overcome some of those issues. But first, it's important to, to plot the occurrence data that you have. And before you plot the occurrence data that you have, first make sure that you're dealing, you filtered your occurrence data so you're only looking at the years that match the environmental predictors that you're going to use. So a lot of these databases will have records from the 1800s, but it's likely that you're not interested in those records. First of all, they're highly imprecise in terms of where on the planet that actual record was collected. Uh, because they didn't have GPS back then, obviously. Um, but they're also often not re um, reflective of the environment which you're trying to 
to represent with your environmental variables. So just make sure that your occurrence data match your, your environmental data when you're doing the modeling. Once you've done that, you can plot them on a map and look at how representative your sampling is of um, geographic space. So, you know, how systematic was the sampling or did you have sort of random systematic sampling or random stratified sampling? So there's all these um, different things to consider when you're looking at your data. And this is a great paper here um, where this figure was taken from um, to let you think about, well, how representative of geographic space was my data? And it's important to keep those areas in the map in mind, you know, you know, this part of New South Wales is poorly represented in my data, maybe. Keep that area in mind so when you present a map, you can let people know that we actually didn't have very much data from that part of the country to inform the model that we're predicting for. So there's also, um, you need to consider environmental space uh, when you're looking at your occurrence data. So maybe you want to use data from just the last two years because you want to be really most you know as, as as recent as possible but when you go to plot the the points so these all these colorful dots are places where surveys have actually been done places in environmental space the gray dots are the environmental space of your entire study area so whatever that might look like and on the x-axis, we have precipitation. On the y-axis, we have temperature. So all these colorful dots reflect different sampling schemes. And where they overlay is where they overlay, not in geographic space, but environmental space. So these dots over here are places where there's quite a bit of precipitation, but it's pretty cold generally. And we do have some sampling in those areas. But if I restricted my data only to the last two years, I might lose some of these points, right? My data might become less representative. How big an issue is that for you? You know, maybe I need to go back 10 years to get fairly representative data. But if I go back too far in time, you know, I'm predicting a forest species in places where the forest no longer exists. So you just have to kind of weigh these out, but you want to keep in mind, again, if you have an area over here, for example, where you just don't have any sampling that's been done in those environmental conditions, you then want to transfer that uncertainty to the map when you're done and say, you know what, we don't know really, we're not too sure about this area over here because we don't have any, any data from those regions on our map. But the first step is just seeing, well, how well does my occurrence data match my environmental space, the environmental data that um, is available within the study area? So again, great, great paper to look at if you want to look further into those things. And then I, I, I talked about this in the previous video, but I think it's, it's worth, worth mentioning again. So one of the primary problems we have with unstructured or opportunistic data, which is most of the biodiversity data that's collected on this planet, is we get most of the records from where people live. So this map on the far left shows all the bird records that have ever been collected in the state of Queensland in Australia. These black areas are places where nobody has done a bird survey that's been recorded in a database. So you could go to a lot of places in Queensland and be a pioneer, record a bird survey where nobody's ever done it before. But these blue colors and purple colors are places where people live, but they're also the places where the most people or the most bird surveys have been done. And if we zoom in on this area, so this is Southeast Queensland. So that's this map here. We can see most of the surveys have been done near the cities of Brisbane and Gold Coast, Sunshine Coast. There's a few places in the Southeast Queensland where you could go and be a pioneer and do a survey where nobody's ever done one before. 
But if you want to do a bird survey close to Brisbane, boy, there's lots of bird surveys that have been done close to Brisbane. And if we're to ask a really naive question of these data, so if somebody gave me $100 million and said, I want you to buy a reserve, buy some private property um, that has the most threatened bird species on it, so we can preserve some threatened birds. Well, that sounds like a good idea. If I take the raw data and I look at, well, where are the private lands and where are the most bird species that have been recorded on private lands? He said, this is the map I get. And sure enough, it looks like, well, the best place to buy a property would be along here in Brisbane because that's where the most threatened species have been recorded. Well, hang on, there's some really great habitat out here, you know, on these farms or on these private forests out this way. Surely that's a better place to put a reserve. But we don't have any data. Like it takes a lot of surveys to pick up rare and threatened species. Sometimes it takes targeted techniques to do that. We've got that in close to Brisbane, but we don't have that kind of survey effort out here. And one of the reasons we need some of these complex modeling techniques is to predict into these areas. Would it make more sense to buy a really big property out here for my $100 million? Or do I really want to buy a little small property where there's a lot of threatened birds that we know about? We can predict into these areas using species distribution modeling techniques, but we can do it much better if we account for this sampling bias in the data. Right? We're going to get much better predictions if we do that. And so there's a, a bias layer which we'll, we'll walk through in some of the code, but there's also um, so many of the correlative techniques in species distribution modeling require a response variable of one if it's present or zero if it's absent. But a lot of times in, in the occurrence data, we don't have those zeros. We just have presence data. But if we want to select some locations that are kind of pseudo absence data, so we think this is, these are places where uh, this bird doesn't occur. If you're working in the eco commons, you can predict randomly located um, pseudo absence locations. So we don't know that it's not there. We're just comparing the presence versus random locations based on some criteria. It might be how far away the point is from the occurrence records, or it might be in different environmental space. So there's a number of ways that you can come at this. But one of the things that isn't in EcoCommons presently is to assume a zero in an area where similar species were recorded, but your target species was not. So if I was building a species distribution model for this cute little powerful owl, and I wanted to generate some pseudo absence data, I would find those grid cells where other owls were located, but the powerful owl was not. And I'm going to be a little more sure that that's an actual zero location than just randomly selecting a place. So it's going to be a little better in terms of a pseudo absence location. And it's been proven to generate better predictions in species distribution models. So it's worth taking this step. And we'll work through how to do these things uh, in the code in just a minute. So I would recommend if you're, um, hopefully you've already had a chance to run through the scripts that we've made available online. And so you can just open up those scripts and we can kind of describe what you were actually doing when you were running that code. If you haven't run the scripts yet, I'd recommend you open those scripts up and um, and as I'm going through the code, you can make some notes in the code. Um, you do that by using the number sign um, at the beginning of the line, and then that line of code won't be run. It's no, it's viewed as just a comment. But we're going to cover uh, in the code real quickly just an overview 
of first how to set up your environment on EcoCommons, um, then how to download and filter the data, and that's something you can do in the point and click environment on EcoCommons as well, but we show you how to do it in R. Uh, we show you how to do some spatial thinning. So if we think back to those, um, if we go back to these, these biased records, one thing we can do is if we just you treated these records as the raw data, we'd be oversampling in these areas close to the city. If we thin out these records, so there's not as many of them, then these records out here will have more weight. Right? So it's one way to over, help overcome some of your bias. So spatial thinning is, is maybe a, a useful step, sometimes a first step in reducing the amount of vir uh, um, bias in your results. So all your presence records aren't near the city. You know, you've got some more of a balanced distribution of records. So we're actually knocking out data um, using this technique. Um, and then the other thing we'll look at is, well, maybe I don't want to knock out that data, or maybe I want to knock out that data and take another step as well. Um, and you can do that by either creating a bias layer and sampling from that bias layer, or you can use targeted background data. And those two things do similar kinds of things in terms of how they deal with bias in, in the data. So, the first step, though, is to log on to EcoCommons and you go to the coding cloud. So when you're choosing your, your analysis hub environment, you pick on coding cloud and you launch a server. And so this little thing will come up and it sometimes takes a little while to launch one. So you get this little bar that's just sort of running for a while. But once it's open, once your server has been launched, you can press open on that. And you should get to this page that looks like this, um, where you can choose RStudio, R, or Python to run your models in. If you don't get to this page, if you click on the file box, you'll get to a Jupyter Hub location once you launch the server. If you don't get to this page, but you want to get to this page because you want to work in RStudio, you click on the file and then new launcher. And that'll launch this little window where you can click on our studio and you can open up our studio. And the nice thing about doing this in EcoCommons is num number one, you can upload your script into our studio just like you would if you were doing it on your PC and run that script, but it might take a while to run. And you can just press run and go grab a coffee or grab some lunch and come back and see if it's finished. Um, the nice thing about EcoCommons is Maxent is already installed. So to run Maxent algorithm, you actually need to download that software from their open source open source location. Um, how to do that is in the script, but you also need Java installed um, in your local environment. So it's already installed in EcoCommons. Um, the, the thing that you need to do when you're setting up your environment that EcoCommons hasn't already taken care of for you is to set your directories. So this can be one of the most fiddly things when you're working with code. Um, so be patient. Uh, you might have to keep coming back to it to get it right, but here we show an example of one way to do that. So if you type in get WD and then open parentheses, you'll get the directory that you're working on currently. Um, when you do that in EcoCommons, it'll be sort of a weird directory. But if you copy and paste that directory and you give it a name, so we're going to call it direct, and you put it in quotes, that'll be your, your your base directory, and then maybe you have a folder that you want to work in just for this part of the the coding. So you'll you'll make a new folder and you'll give it a name. So you'll make a new folder in our studio possibly, and then you'll transfer that name here. Um, you'll have a backslash in front of it because this is going to be um, added to the end of this. So this is your directory 
and this might be the folder that you want to work in, then you're going to set your working directory. Paste zero means we're just going to ignore that comma. It's going to put this together with that. So it's just going to append the SDM and R onto the end here. Um, that's probably a bit of a tedious explanation for those who have done a lot of this, but if you're new to setting a working directory, it takes a minute and it can be kind of fiddly. So, um, but this is a good way to do it. If you um, set this call, then if you bring your script to somewhere else, all you have to do is change your directory and your folder in the new environment that you're working in. So once you've got that ready to go, you've uploaded your script, um, then you should be ready to go. And so I'm going to, I'm not going to go through every line of code. There's, there's sort of annotation in the code, you know, those comments behind the, the pound signs. And there's other bits of code that, you know, take you through, um, for example, this is how to download data from the Atlas of Living Australia. Um, there's a lot of things that I show in the code that aren't reflected here. That's just to give you more of a sense of what, what the code does, but this is the core bit of it. First of all, you have to have made an account with the Atlas of Living Australia. So I made an account and that was my email address. You will need to make an account and put your email address in here, right? Um, once that's done, this is the code that allows you to download and filter all the records you're interested in. So Gala Call um, tells, tells ALA, um, I'm, I'm interested in, in querying the ALA database, essentially. Um, these operators mean that this is all together, so this is a pipe. And the next line of code here says, well, this is the kind of, this is the species name that I'm interested in. And the next line says, and I only want those records that were generated by the frog ID project. So there's all kinds of records from all kinds of different sources. But actually the frog ID records, I know um, they're acoustic recordings made by citizen scientists that are vetted by professionals. So all of the frog ID records um, have been vetted to make sure that um, all the frogs available in that location where they were making the recording were identified. So it's a pretty rigorous occurrence citizen science data set. Um, I'm also going to only use records that have coordinate uncertainty of less than 100. So if somebody was not sure if they were here or 10 kilometers away, I don't want that data. I want to I want to model at a finer resolution than that. But you might play with this number, and playing with this number might get you more records depending on on what you're doing. And Gala select, that just means I want the data set name column as well as um, these other columns. So if I don't I don't need to filter this column, but I want to include it in my data set. And Atlas occurrences means we're going to generate an occurrence data set from this query. Once you've done that, you can you can write that file. So LIPE just stands for Limnodynastes Peronae, so this little uh, this little frog. And um, then you can select the subset of that data that's important to you. So you're going to get um, a lot more columns of data than you need. I only am interested in columns two through five, so that's what this is doing. If you have more questions about how to download and filter data from ALA, um, you can visit this website. It, it walks you through the various things that you can do. Um, and again, you can do a lot of this within EcoCommons. There's now a filter option for ALA data, um, but you might have some real specific, uh, so ALA collects a lot of columns of data a lot of different kinds of, of data 
for each record, for each row, there's a lot of columns. And not all the columns are available for filtering within EcoCommons. So there might be one something that you're specifically interested in. If it's not available, you can do your filtering this way in R. Um, you can also do a similar thing. I'm not going to walk through all of this data, but it's a similar workflow if you're using GBIF data. Um, so this is the kind of thing you would do. You um, first identify what your species is. You have an object that's called my species. Um, so it'd be it's something in quotes, Latoria, Parani in our in our instance. Um, you only want those records that actually have coordinates, um, and you might increase the limit, the number of records that you want for that species. And you're going to get all kinds of data available. This is just um, subsetting that data to these columns. So we're using the column names instead of the column numbers, but it's a similar process to what ALA does. Um, we're going to turn it into a tibble, which is just a kind of a data table. And um, then we're going to subset it. So we only want the frog ID records. Um, here we've increased the coordinate uncertainty to 200. Um, and we want to get rid of the NA data um, that's in, that might be in the data set name. So we don't want uh, records that are NA in the frog ID column. So a very similar workflow. This is the way you do it in GBIF. We've got another example in one of our uh, use cases, which is um, downloading some, some frog data um, and creating a, a, a little species distribution model using Maxent. So there's another use case that walks you through a similar workflow, but it goes into a little more detail with GBIF. So we do have more material than that. Just check out our website. So the next steps um, that relate to your occurrence data also relate to um, sort of the base layer of environmental data that you're going to use throughout the process. So the first step here is to identify an environmental layer that has the resolution, so the grid cell size, it has the extent, um, and it might have more than the of the extent than you're interested in, but you want an environmental layer that has the coordinate reference system, uh, so it tells you how that that data has been projected onto the Earth. Um, and different coordinate reference systems do different things with, you know, a grid to make it fit on a sphere, right? Um, generally, we don't worry too much about things when we're using regional extents. So this is a, a non-projected WGS84 coordinate reference system. But the extent, so we want at least it to cover Australia, and um, we're actually going to narrow that extent to just uh, records within uh, Queensland for this species. And the way we're going to do that is first we, we select the layer that we want to use, that we want to match. So every other environmental record, uh, environmental layer is going to have the grid cell size, and the coordinate reference system of this data set. So um, this is um, an environmental or um, it's a vegetation index, EVI. And it's, uh, it's like NDVI, only a little better. But it uh, gets at vegetation greenness. But that's, that's the base layer that we want everything else to match to. So then we're going to take that LIPE is the name of the data table with all of our species records from ALA. And we're going to turn the latitude and longitude into a spatial points layer. So we're going to tell our code 
that those coordinates relate to actual latitudes and longitudes on the ground. And this is the, the coordinate reference system that we want to match it to. So we want to match these points to the same coordinate ref reference system as these. Um, if your points are in a different um, coordinate reference system, um, you want to use a different, you'll have to reproject the, these data. Um, I'm not sure if we've included that in these code or not, but most everything that we're working with is already in this, this projection. But you can't just assign a coordinate reference system to data that was built uh, or projected in, in a different coordinate reference system. So you have to identify the coordinate reference system that your original data was in and then reproject it into the coordinate reference system that you're using. So that's that's that'll be this one. The other thing that we're doing is we're creating, um, first we're creating a convex hull around all of our occurrence data. So all these lat longs that were generated and were, were, be, were told those lat longs are spatial locations. We've put a polygon around them and then we've buffered that polygon by one degree, right? So we've made the polygon even larger and kind of smoothed it out. And so that's going to be our study area. So these two lines of codes do that. Um, they're doing it with this package, RGOs. So when anytime you see something in front of two colons, that's the package and that's the function within the package. And that's the object that it's acting on. So we're acting on the spatial points layer, um, which is just our, um, think of it as a, uh, it's not a shape file, but think of it as a point shape file. It's the same kind of thing. It's a spatial points layer. Um, then if we crop this layer, so that means we're gonna, everything outside of this in Australia, we're not interested in, and we're gonna mask it as well. Uh, a lot of times if you just crop it, you'll get, um, you'll get areas beyond your polygon. So you have to mask it as well if you're going to just get the polygon. Then if we take that, that layer that we've cropped and masked and we divide it by itself, it turns all of these cells into one. And that makes, that gives us our base layer. So this is the extent that we want. We don't want all of Australia. We just want this part of Queensland. We want the cell size to be there approximately one kilometer um, wide in, in here. Um, and we want the CRS to be this WGS84. So all of the other environmental data are gonna have to match this base layer. And then we're gonna write that base layer to a file. So just write raster does that. Um, this is, we're gonna say we want it in the data subfolder of the folder that we're, of the directory that we set earlier. And we've just given it a name. And we've written, written override equals true, which just means that if there's another base layer, it's gonna just replace that one. So that's how to sort of define your study area and make a base environmental layer for the modeling that you're going to do. And those steps are still important for your occurrence data as well. So we'll talk a little bit more about that here. So if we want to do spatial thinning, one way to do it is to take that base layer and then we're going to make some cells that are four times larger than that base layer. So we're going to take the base layer but we're going to make those cells, you know, four kilometers by four kilometers instead of one kilometer by one kilometer. And then we're going to extract. So we're going to take that, that spatial points layer and we're going to extract the cell numbers from this large base that we created. So what we've done is 
all the cells in your raster have a unique ID. And what we've done is for every point location, we've extracted the cell number um, in a larger uh, cell size. So imagine if here in the smaller cell size, each cell near Brisbane had on average five records. Now each cell is going to have um, 16 records on average, right? So we've got a lot more more records per cell if we use this larger um, resolution, right? And then, then we're going to put all this together in one flat file. So we're taking all our occurrence data, so that includes our lats, our longs, um, whatever else we had in that table, and we're going to add the cell number. So the cell number that is related to each um, larger cell, right? So now we're going to have lots of rows of data, and near the city, you know, there might be upwards of 50 um, of these cell numbers that are identical for different rows of data. So 50 rows of data might have different lat longs or different dates that they were collected, but they're going to have the same cell number. Whereas we, if we get out here, you probably still only have one data point um, with that particular cell number. So we've kept all, all of our original records. We've just told the table, right? How many of them belong to each of these larger cell cells within this raster layer that we created here. So the next step is we're gonna we're gonna thin out those records. And we're gonna do that simply by taking this big table with the cell numbers in it, right? And we're going to group by cells. So that means we're going to do something um, to each unique cell number that's in this table. And what we're going to do is we're going to slice sample. And we're just going to take one record from each one of those rows of data with the same cell number. So it, essentially, we're getting rid of all the duplicates, but we're doing so at random. So if we have 100, you know, lat longs, but they're all within one four kilometer by four kilometer cell, that means we've got 100 records in that one cell. This is just going to randomly select one of them. So one of those random lat longs is going to be selected. So we've really thinned out the data quite a bit. And we've gotten rid of duplicates at the same time. So um, a handy little function. And then we're going to take these data, so the, the thinned data, and we're going to turn these into a spatial points layer. So those latitudes and longitudes are going to become um, a spatial points layer. And that's, you could use those data as your, your presence data. So as a spatially thinned presence data. And then the next step we're going we're gonna to play with is the idea of creating bias layers and and targeted background points. So they're two separate things that do similar things. And we're going to have to do that by, um, in this case, we're downloading all the frog records uh, within ALA. Right? So using the GALA call, we're taking similar criteria, right? but we're going to we want frog ID records that have identified any frog and turn that into an occurrence data set called frogs. And so now we have tons of 
tons of duplicates in all of these cells, right? And what we're going to do is we're going to create a new column of data. So that's what this frogs, we're going to call it unique visit. That's the new column within the database frogs, with, uh, not data table frogs. Paste zero means we're going to just paste these things together with no commas. So we're going to take the latitude, the longitude, and the date that this was surveyed. And so it's going to be one big um, sort of unique uh, string of latitude, longitude, and, and date. Then we're going to um, define each one of those unique values as its own factor. So you might have repeated factors if they have the same lat, long, and date. And then we're going to subset that data with frogs too. We're just taking the columns that we're interested in out of all of this. And then we're going to summarize that data. So for every unique latitude, longitude, and visit ID, which is is this here, um, we're going to summarize, well, what was the number of um, of unique scientific names that were identified in that. So that gives you some idea of species richness in each one of those cells. So frogs three is giving us an understanding of um, for every lat, long, and visit ID, um, how many species were observed at those locations. And then we're going to group by um, just latitude and longitude and get a sense of how many unique um, unique visits um, were conducted at, at those uh, latitudes and longitudes. So we're, we're dropping out um, date from those. So we're just including locations that within any latitude and longitude that match and we're counting those and we're turning this into a spatial points layer as well and so when when we're done with this we're going to turn that spatial points layer back into a raster layer using this function called rasterize so we're going to take our visits points um, we're going to create a raster with the same extent and um, a CRS and resolution as, as our base layer. And we're going to sum the number of visits to each one of those locations. And the background is going to be made to equal to zero. So that'll give us a sense of the survey effort in different grid cells um, within this region. So how many different locations were, were surveyed uh, within each of these grid cells? And that gives us sort of a, a number of visits. Um, so each, each number in each grid cell corresponds to roughly the number of visits. We're going to add the base to that B1 layer just because we don't want any zeros in our file. So that's one way to create um, a, a bias file. So if you have a lot of survey data across your study area, um, you don't want zeros because you're going to use um, this layer to select your, your background points or your absence points, but you're going to use this number as the how likely is that cell going to be selected? So essentially, if there's a high number here, there's a high probability that that will be included in your in your background data or in your pseudo absence data. Um, but you don't want any zeros, so that's why we've added ones to everything, which is just adding base here. So. We're then going to extract 
all of the cell numbers from this using these data from this layer here. And then we're going to turn that into a data frame where we omit um, NA values from, from this entire data frame. And we're going to get a cell ID um, vector, which is going to take the unique cell numbers. from these data. So from visit locations, which, which got the cell numbers, we only want one cell number. Um, we don't want uh, repeated cell numbers. Because the next step is we're going to take, we want the X, Y locations. So we want the Latin along from these cells that, um, that meet these criteria. So where there were um, multiple visits where there were one, one or more visit in each cell. So essentially this is our presence locations. If we ignore the fact that within visit points um, there's duplicates. Here we're just getting rid of those duplicates and so we're taking the XY location from each one of these rasters based on the cell ID value. Right, so now we're going to take. Um, we've got we've got these X Y visit locations, but these visit locations don't include locations that are representative of the entire study area. So we need that for the next step. So what we're going to do is we're going to create something called a bounding box. So bounding box returns the minimum and maximum latitudes. Um, and then we're just going to rearrange these minimum and maximum la longitudes. So we have uh, one corner and the opposing corner, so at a diagonal. And we can add those to the XY visits table. So by doing that, we ensure that the next step is going to be run through our entire grid. It's not just going to be run for those places where we have presence data um, from this XY visits table. So once we've done this, and, and this is just um, some steps that you might need to take to run this next function if you are running it in a local environment. But fortunately at EcoCommons, uh, you don't need to take this step. But once you've got this, this data, so the VXY2 includes all of your presence locations plus the two lat longs you need to define the entire study area. Once you've done that, um, then you can use something in the mass package where we run this kernel density function across the available um, data. That you're that you're using, and so essentially, um, uh, kernel density is a non-parametric uh, smoothing parameter. But it, you can look at the results here, and what what you're doing is those places where there's lots of surveys um, get a higher score than those places where there's been very few or no surveys. So that's what that's what this brilliant line of code is doing for you. You have to run this line of code, which takes a while if it's a big data set. Um, one of the reasons we only focused on Queensland is because this takes a really long time if you run it on all the records in Australia. Um, then you turn this into a raster. And so you're drawing from that grid um, that has all the points in it that you need, the lats and the longs. And then we're um, setting that new raster as the same as base and we're masking that raster. So the, the result we get is here. So why have we done that? So essentially the, the darker these colors get, the more surveys have been done in that geographic area. 
So this is geographically smoothed out. You know, kind of the areas around Brisbane tend to get the most surveys. And the reason we've done that is later in, in the model fitting stage, we can use this layer or any raster layer that we've created that has different values in it. Um, and if there are no zeros in it, um, then when you use this function, it'll randomly select points within, somewhat randomly, select points within this, this polygon or within this extent of your raster grid. But it's going to, it's probably it's going to be more likely that it's going to select a point here than it will be to select a point here. So that just means that your background data or your pseudo absence data is going to reflect the sampling bias um, that is in your presence data. So that means your model isn't going to be comparing these areas to these areas as much. It's going to be comparing areas where it knows some surveys have been done with some areas where you actually have presence records. So um, it'll include some of these places, but you're more likely to select either pseudo absence locations or background locations in these places with higher values. And you do that with this function here. So that is a real game changer in terms of your results. And um, we'll look at some of those later, but it's not something that is yet available in EcoCommons. So if, if sampling bias is a, is a big issue in your data, I would highly recommend it. You think about thinning your occurrence data, possibly um, using a bias layer or using targeted background points. Now, targeted background points um, are a similar kind of a process. So you remember that B1 raster layer that we created? where each value um, in that um, raster related to the, the, to the survey effort that occurred in that grid cell, right? And we're gonna say, well, if that, if that number is greater than three, or if it's less than three, we're gonna say that's a zero. Okay, so we're only interested in finding those records within that data set. And look at this grid cell, it's had a lot of visits in it. Um, but we're only interested in those grid cells with um, greater than three or more visits. So we're, what this matrix is doing, so we're cre creating a matrix where we have zero, 2.9 and zero, and then 2.9, uh, 3, um, 3, 2, 4, 7, which is the maximum number um, of in the survey effort raster. And what, what this is doing is essentially it's saying all values between 0 and 2.9 are going to be transferred to 0. All values between 2.9 and over 3,000 are going to be changed to a one. So we're going to define this vector as a matrix with three columns. Three columns, two rows. So this is going to be the top row, and that's going to be the bottom row. And then we're going to do something from the raster package, and we're going to reclassify our B1 raster. So again, this is the raster that gives us an imp some information on survey effort. And we're going to reclass it, reclassify it um, based on this matrix, which is these values here. And so you could come up with, um, you know, more rows of data if you wanted, you know, so you could reclassify a whole bunch of stuff using this kind of um, system, but here we're keeping it pretty simple. We're just going to reclass all our values as either zero or one, and we'll use this a few times. So this is a good one to get your head around. And then we're going to call that places with three or more visits. And we're going to mask it um, using the base layer. 
And then we're going to look at, well, how, how many results do we get in the three or more visits table, right? Um, so how many ones are there? How many zeros are there? And that's what the frequency does, is it summarizes each of the unique values in your raster data set. And then we're going to take, um, we're going to repeat the number one, um, and we're going to call it LIPE presence. So these are presence points, and it's we're going to repeat the number one just as many times as there are unique rows of decimal latitude, not unique rows of rows um, in the LIPE database or data table, I should say. Um, we're then going to turn this into a raster, right? So essentially we've, um, we've repeated one across every, every row of data. We're going to rasterize those and We're going to turn it into a um, into a raster. We're going to use function minimum, which means it's going to it's not going to sum these ones if they're in the same grid cell. It's just going to create a one for every grid cell where we have um, where a Limnodynasties parani frog was observed. So that's what this data is doing, or what this line of data is doing, is it's creating a raster um, with all your presence points, just given a one um, within your, your extent of the base. And then we're going to mask that out again, and we're going to look at the frequencies. So how many, how many presence points are there? So essentially now we've got this LIP presence two raster has values that are one or zero. It's a one if that frog was observed in that grid cell. We have another raster layer where any frog, including our target species, was observed. And each grid cell in that is coded as either one or zero. So that this raster, visits three or more is the raster where any frog was observed in our study area. This raster is where our target species was observed. And here, we're just subtracting the places, all the places where any frog was observed, we're subtracting all the places where our target species was, was observed. And then when we look at the frequency of, of that layer, um, you'll notice that we get some negative one values. So the reason we've gotten negative one values, so you should, this should give you zeros for background places. And this subtraction should give you a one for every place where a different frog was observed but your target species was not observed, right? So these are kind of zeros for our target species. But the problem is, is sometimes um, there were places where the only frog that was observed um, was our target species. And um, when we subtract that from this, we got a few negative values. Um, ideally, that shouldn't happen. Um, probably had something to do with the way we filtered the data. Um, I think when we filtered it, we changed the, the spatial extent to 200 meters versus 100 meters. So we're going to zero out those negative values as well. So that's this reclassification is just taking that raster and saying, well, we don't want those zero values. So we're going to class anything that's negative to zero, and we're going to keep those things that are 
positive um, between uh, point one and two, we're going to classify those as ones. So finally, this zero LIPE2 raster gives us a one for every place where a frog other than our target species was observed, right? So if our target species was observed there, it's a zero. If no frogs were observed there, the raster is a zero. So then we're gonna take those latitudes and longitudes and pull them out of that raster. So from that, that raster, um, we're gonna find all of those locations um, where the value is equal to one, and we're going to extract those cell values. So that unique cell identifier that each cell in the raster has. And then just like we did before, we're going to extract the lats and longs from the cell values from this, um, from this new object. And the result is going to give us a data frame with lats and longs for all the locations where a frog survey was done, but no, none of our target species were identified. Um, then we're going to turn that into a, a data frame. We're going to make a new column called presence, and we're going to code that as zero, because for our species, that's a zero. It's not a true zero, but it's a place where we're more sure that no, our target species was not located. Now, clearly there's, there's some assumptions here, and this is not a perfect system, right? Um, you might wanna bump up the number of visits to 100 ideally, because we're talking about a pretty big grid cell. And we're saying, well, if you've done three, three surveys anywhere in that grid cell, chances are you would have run into our species. But that might be totally bogus, right? Because you might not be sampling in the right habitat within that grid cell, or you might have just not detected it. But it's a better absence location than just randomly uh, picking locations. And just like the bias layer, it's going to reflect the bias in your data. You're more likely to get these zero locations in places where there are a lot of frog surveys have been done. So it achieves a similar, um, a similar result is you get this data file that you can now write to your disk, which highlights those places, those locations where there's a better chance that your target species was not present, but are still suitable locations in that area for frogs. And there's been surveys done in that area for frogs. So we're gonna come back to this, but this has just been a, an example of one way to account for some of those issues with bias um, in your data. And there's a number of different ways that you can um, tell how well you've predicted your data. The really great thing about the occurrence data sets that are becoming increasingly available is there's growing um, numbers of independent data that you can use to assess how well your model actually predicted. So, uh, things like um, acoustic monitoring. So people are putting out sensors in places where people don't have time to do lots of surveys, and they're picking up a lot of species that otherwise would have been missed. Those are independent data to the normal sampling regime that's in um, in the data, the occurrence data set that you're using. Uh, we saw in another example in a previous video how uh, telemetry data can be used as independent locations. Um, camera traps are increasingly being deployed. Sometimes you get really nice systematic surveys that were 
just looking for your target species in an area. That's good independent data. And later we're going to show how independent data can be used to assess how well your model is performing. But you don't always have that kind of independent data available. So another way to, to do model validation is if you have enough data, you can randomly take 20% of it, not use it when you're training your model, so not using it to build your model, but just using that random 20% of data to test your model. So I just wanted to throw this slide out there because sometimes you'll want to subset your data uh, before you take the next steps. So we've got a, a nice set of presence absence locations, but we might want to, or presence pseudo absence locations or presence pseudo or, or presence background locations, but we might want to subset those data um, for testing later. Um, so just keep in mind, if you don't have that independent data, you'll want to subset about 20% of it. And we have a um, an EY frog challenge uh, notebook that's available with code that shows you how to do that um, for a Maxent problem with frogs on our website. So you can check that out if, if, if you don't have independent data. And then cross-validation or bootstrapping are just um, things that you can do within the data set that you're using. Um, and just testing your training data is probably the least effective way to see how well you're predicting. And again, going into the process, you just want to keep in mind, are there areas in Southwest WA where the environmental space wasn't well sampled? The environmental space here is different, but it wasn't well sampled. You might want to re show that in your maps, or there wasn't very many geographic sampling locations in this area, right? So both the geographic spaces is not sampled, but also the environmental space isn't represented, right? So you might want to keep in mind, where are those locations where geographic space wasn't um, sampled, but maybe the environmental space was well sampled. So it's not that big a deal to suggest that, oh, maybe they're here. But if this area didn't have any geographic sampling locations and it's in part of the environmental space that wasn't well sampled, you know there's a lot more uncertainty in your model results in these locations. There's just something to keep in mind um, how you interpret your data once you're all done. So we'd welcome your feedback. Um, you can uh, log on to sort of the pre-release version of EcoCommons. If you want to do that, get in touch with us. You can sign up to be a tester. But if you do do that, we ask that you, there's a little feedback button on the side of the uh, EcoCommons site. Uh, we ask that you give us positive or negative feedback. Tell us what's working, what's not working, what you'd like to see. Um, and if you need to learn some more coding before the examples, codes that, that we've provided make sense, a great way to get started on learning code in R. We've got a couple of videos that Amelia has put together on how to code in R. And there's a module as well. Um, so the module you can go through at this website. Our website has within the educational material has some videos that walk you through this material. Uh, we also have use cases, so other examples of other things that you can do in, in modeling, both in the R environment and in the, the point and click dashboards. So if any of this is of interest to you or what, what's coming, I mean, generalized dissimilarity modeling is, is on the way. There's other workflows that will become available. Uh, just visit our website and sign up for our newsletter. So you, know, you can follow our journey as we go towards launch in November 2022. And again, I just want to thank all the, the many people who make all the work we do possible. And uh, thank you. That was That's the end of step one, the occurrence data. It's one of the longer ones. It's surprisingly more to do with occurrence data than others, but 
Uh, the next module is module two on environmental data.